behind the house as well. So, how are you feeling? I'm great, and I'm so happy to I'm so happy to be here today. Yeah, yeah. it's great to have you here. Yeah. yeah. So, the first question we would like to start with concerns your background as an investigative journalist. Um, obviously, you are most well-known for your investigation on Harvey Weinstein, but you have done amazing work when it comes to um, predatory doctors, abandoned children, or unjustly rapists. Do you feel like there's an overarching theme in the topics you choose to investigate? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that there is certainly a theme that has emerged if you look back yep. at the reporting I've done in the last 10 years. I, when I, I got my start at the, in Chicago, where I grew up, and I did a lot of reporting on victims of sex crimes there, and reporting that made a difference. Uh, you know, sometimes people will ask how it is that I've been able to continue reporting on what at first glance is such an, an admittedly depressing topic. But I found the work really galvanizing because when I did stories in Chicago on sex abusing doctors who had continued to practice on uh, police and prosecutors who were shelving valuable DNA evidence gathered from the scene of sex crimes uh, you know, without, without having it tested, um, one of the things that made me continue to do that work is that it made a difference. Yeah. Doctors went to prison following my stories, laws were changed to better protect victims, and so I felt like this work was really meaningful and could be very impactful. That said, when I joined the New York Times in 2016 as an investigative reporting, as an investigative reporter, my first assignment was to do stories on then-candidate Donald Trump's yeah. treatment of women and that was really bruising reporting. I worked with some of the women, first women who went public with their allegations of sexual misconduct against Trump. And that was a really difficult experience. Yes, there were people, some people who believed those women and took them seriously and applauded them for going on the record, but they also suffered a lot of attacks. Trump called them liars, he threatened to sue them, he threatened to sue me when I was on the yeah. phone with him trying to get comments. He screamed at me and called me a disgusting human being. So heading into 2007, and then I co helped cover his election. So yeah. um, I will confess that heading into 2017, I was starting to have my first doubts about whether or not this type of reporting could make a difference. Yeah. So we talked about it off stage that you were really, really busy going to different cities sitting on stages like ours, and that's different to the investigative work that you've talked about just now. So how does it feel to do this kind of social commentary on the work that you've done? Well, you know, one of the things that Jody and I always point out is even as we have uh, been asked to talk publicly about this work and about this movement, that we really make sure that we distinguish ourselves from activists. We are not, um, here on stage, we are not <clears throat> on tour, we are never in these public forums to give our opinions. We're not here to advocate or lobby for certain changes. Uh, we are here to, because we are reporters and we view our job as going out and collecting the facts and publishing the truth. And in this case, one of the reasons that we wanted to write our book is that as journalists, we had never before been part of a story that had had such a huge impact. I mean, we, like the rest of the world, watched with wonder as the dam broke. I mean, we had been for months working so diligently to try to you know, write the story of Harvey Weinstein and encountering challenges at every turn. And so when we finally went, went to go publish, push publish on the story, we had no idea what was going to happen. In fact, there was one night, two nights, actually two nights before the story was published, Jody and I had been working around the clock at the New York Times, and at one o'clock in the morning, we said, okay, we've got to call it a night. We have to go home and get some sleep. And as we were sharing a cab back to Brooklyn from the newsroom in Midtown Manhattan, it was the first time in the sort of hushed quiet of the cab that we turned to each other and said, do you think anybody's going to read this story? <laughs> um, which is just, I, which I say because we really had no clue what the impact might be. And within three days, I'd say, of the story being published, we could feel that something really significant was starting to happen. Yeah. Our 
emails and our phones were flooded with women who were coming to us with their own stories of abuse and harassment, not just with Weinstein, but you know, in all different types of industries, women from all different types of backgrounds. And so we really did our response to that as a response to everything that has happened in the last two years was to keep reporting. Yeah. So leading on to your investigation on Harvey Weinstein, the editors of the New York Times decided to focus on the issue of sexual harassment after the Bill O'Reilly scandal. Mm -hmm. So where did this intuition come from, mm -hmm. that this was more than just a one-man problem? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I had thought that the election of Trump was kind of maybe the end of the line for this type of reporting in 2017. I was thinking, well, maybe, this, maybe these types of allegations don't matter. But I think that what was actually happening was that the stage was starting to be set for something monumental. And you could see that in the protests in Washington right after the election, the thousands, the tens of thousands of women and men who took to the streets in their pink pussy hats <laughs> um, to, to say, no, we actually do care about this issue, it does matter. And then what happened in the spring of 2017 was that our colleagues, Emily Steele and Mike Schmidt, broke the story of Bill O'Reilly. And I know that that may seem like a 100 sexual harassment stories ago, but at the time it was really significant. Um, they were able to show that Bill O'Reilly, probably the most famous, powerful figure in conservative media in the United States, had paid off women who had come forward with allegations against him of sexual misconduct. Bill O'Reilly and Fox News, they were able to show, had ultimately paid out more than $40 million in secret settlements to cover up allegations against him. And so when our colleagues published that story in the New York Times in the spring of 2017, the impact was almost immediate. Uh, Bill O'Reilly was actually fired from yeah. Fox News. And it wasn't that Fox was unaware of these allegations. They had actually helped to pay some of these women off. It was the public airing of those allegations in the pages of the New York Times. And, and was it unique that someone was fired for it? And it was unique, yes, that was unique, that the, 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 the impact, the advertisers at Fox yeah. basically revolted and said, we're gonna pull our dollars if this guy is allowed to stay yeah. on the air. So at the New York Times, we reporters and editors took notice of that and said, what, I mean, we asked what may now sound like a very quaint question, which is like, are there other powerful men who have abused women and covered it up? And that was the moment where we decided as a news organization that we were going to make a firm commitment to reporting on this issue. We were gonna report not just into Hollywood and the alleged predator that was Harvey Weinstein, we were gonna also report into Silicon Valley and into the restaurant industry and into you know, auto plants in Chicago. And so the Weinstein investigation was one of a series of reporting paths that we were going down as we made a commitment to sexual harassment coverage that year. So reading your book, one of the things that struck me is you really had to go out and find the story. And that really involved going to people's houses, knocking on people's doors, and um, yeah, so there was one example where you, or Jody, went to someone's house and really knocked on their door and confronted them with something that had happened 10 or 15 years before. And what's that like as an investigative journalist to do that? Well, this is another reason that we were so excited to write the book. Um, so much of investigative reporting, so much of the Weinstein reporting took place in secret. Um, it was confidential at the time that we were engaging in it. And uh, what we did in this book is we spent a lot of time reporting all these things that happened off the record in secret onto the record so that readers could be with us there yeah. when we were having our first hush conversations with Rose McGowan, Ashley Judd, Gwyneth Paltrow, who was one of our secret sources that nobody knew about before the book. Um, and we were also able to show a lot of the challenges that we encountered. Not only were these famous actresses terrified to go on the record, but we were also starting to realize that there was another entire category of alleged victims, young women who had gone to work for Harvey Weinstein and his companies right out of college because they wanted to be producers, they wanted to work behind the scenes, and going to work for Harvey Weinstein was a ticket in. Like if you could get one of those jobs and survived, it was really seen as like put, putting you on a path 
uh, an insider path to the industry. And what we realized as our reporting went on in the summer of 2017 is that many of those women had also seen their professional ambitions turned against him, that he had also preyed on many of his own employees. So there was a moment in the summer of 2017, there was a young woman that we had heard had actually worked for Weinstein in 1990 and had been uh, had suffered an alleged sexual assault by him and had disappeared from the company. And so we were able to figure out, she had basically disappeared from the entire entertainment industry. We came to see her as kind of the patient zero of our investigation. And there was a moment, I was, we had been able to identify, she was living in a different, she, she didn't live in New York, she lived in another city. We were able to figure out where she was working. So I would call up her place of work and leave messages at the front desk saying that I was a New York Times reporter and I wanted to speak with her, but not saying the nature of my call, you know, why I was calling because I didn't want to reveal something so personal to her employer. So she wasn't returning my calls and finally I decided that I was going to take a trip out to a suburb of New York. We knew that she had a family member who lived there. So I drove out there and I had in my hand a, a handwritten card that I, in which I explained who I was and why we were doing this story. And my intention was I was going to del deliver it to this family member or I was going to slip it under the door with the hopes that they could get it into the hands of this woman and, and she would know why I was pursuing her so hard. So when I get up to the door, the woman who answers is actually the woman herself from 1990. And she looked at me and she said, I can't believe you found me. And then she also said, I've actually been waiting for this knock on my door for 25 years. But she was, as it turned out, legally prohibited from telling me what had happened to her because the other thing that we were learning in the course of this investigation, one of the biggest challenges that we were facing was that this woman from 1990 was one of ultimately 12 women who had come forward with allegations of Harvey, against Harvey Weinstein over the years and had been silenced through a secret settlement. So if she told us what had happened to her, she would have been violating the terms of those secret settlements. But this woman, she was waiting for your knock on her door, but are there not moments where people are not waiting for the knock on your door? I think there was an example when uh, your colleague, Jody Castro, mm -hmm. spoke to someone's husband mm -hmm. and mentioned the story and he didn't even right. know about it. So this was a woman, this was a woman who had been waiting for the knock on her door but was still terrified to speak. There was another woman who had been silenced through a secret settlement in the late 90s. Another woman who had worked as an assistant for Miramax, for Harvey Weinstein at Miramax, his first company. And so my colleague Jody had done a similar trip to this woman lived in California and Jody fl flew out to California and she showed up in this woman's driveway. And the woman was not home, but her husband was there. And Jody explained to her why she was there and why she, we were reporting on this and explained that she thought that this man's wife had a story to tell. And the husband's looking at her and saying, no, 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 my wife, my wife doesn't have a story about Harvey Weinstein. That must be an uncomfortable experience. And, and it was, and, and she's, and as in Jody's saying, her first thought was, okay, well, this is, this is what you say. This is what somebody who has a secret settlement or their husband would say. This is exactly what they would say. So she kind of kept prodding and prodding. And ultimately, as the conversation went on, and she said, he even said to her at one point, he kind of gesture to the house behind him, like their family home. And he says, does, do I look, you know, do I look like a man whose wife got a big secret settlement? I mean, it was not a, it wasn't a big fancy home. And as the conversation went on, she realized, oh my God, he really doesn't know. This was ultimately a woman who had, um, you know, as she tells it, been raped, uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein had tried to rape her when she was working as a young assistant in his company. She had been, she and another one of her colleagues had gone to, had gone to their superiors at the company, to the managers to report this. They wanted to do something about it. They wanted to hold the boss accountable. And they too were steered into these secret settlements in which they were prohibited. If they had to turn over all evidence of what had happened, uh, they had to, if they wanted to see a therapist, the therapist had to sign a confidentiality clause. And when reporters came knocking, they could not, they could never speak about what had happened. And what Jody realized, what we ultimately realized, um, was that this woman had not even told her own family. So other than those limited through settlements, 
there were also those that weren't. And I'm interested, when it came to the first article, what differentiated those that decided to go on the record and what those that were off the record? Right, yeah, so one of the things that we did, and another one of the reasons that we wanted to write this book is that in that first story, first, you know, in that first story we had been able to connect some of the dots about how this pr powerful producer had been able to prey on women for decades and cover it up. But what we did in the course of reporting this book was that we were able to like piece, we, had, we were able to bring, in, bring together so many additional pieces of the puzzle. So we were able to pull the curtain back on the machinery that was in place to silence these women, the high priced lawyers, the private investigators that Harvey hired to try to stop us and to target, the, you know, to target women who we thought were gonna go public. And we also were able to we were also able to kind of pull the curtain back on the like brave sources who participated in this work. I think it can sometimes, you know, in 2019, you know, more than two years into the Me Too movement taking off in earnest, it can feel like all of this was, um, was inevitable. And what we show is as we take you back to ground zero that, these, that this really was something that was put in motion by the brave decisions of very specific women and sources who what faced wrenching about? decisions about whether or not to go on the record. So in our very first story, I mean, we were able to show that we had been working with, that we had been working with a variety of women who had stories about Weinstein, um, famous actresses, you know, the women who had worked in his companies, other, you know, male employees who had got glimpses of the problem. And at the end, months into it, nobody wanted to go on the record. And in the end of the day, there were two, only two women who went on what the record in our first them? story. Like, is so it their one, situation or their personality? Yeah, so one was Ashley Judd, and she's, I think she's a much more well-known, visible mm -hmm. figure. We are, the history books have been quick to kind of uh, remember her, and no surprise, she's been this glamorous movie star for many years, people were familiar with the, you know, they had watched her movies, and, um, but what, what people may not realize is that she was also somebody who had spent years uh, engaging in activism and academic study around the issues of gender equality. She'd even spent time at Harvard studying this. And so when we came to her and asked her to be the first actress, and ultimately the only actress to go on the record in our first story, uh, she, you know, well, we caught, when, we, when we made the call, she was at the dentist's office. And so she said, I'm gonna take, you know, I need a day, I'm gonna get back to you. And she went for a run, she's a Christian, she prayed to her God, and she came back to us and said, I'm prepared to be a name source in your investigation to go where no other actress was willing to go at that particular moment in time. And for her, it was, actually just an extension of uh, a commitment that she had made to these issues many years before. Um, she has long said that you kind of choose the, you know, that you choose the mountain and the issue on which you're willing to kind of die and that the equality of the sexes is the one that she had chosen years before. So for her, it ultimately became a pretty serene decision. Laura Madden um, was another, was the other woman, the, the second woman to go on the record in our story. Not a famous actress, somebody who had been living a very quiet life in Wales. She was um, a stay-at-home mom, somebody who had thought she wanted to go work in the entertainment industry and had been preyed upon, allegedly preyed upon by Harvey Weinstein when she was a young assistant at Miramax. And she ultimately, and we realized that when she was deciding whether or not to go on the record, it coincided with her having to have a surgery for breast cancer. So when we heard that, we thought, there's no way that Laura is gonna do this. I mean, it's so hard. Nobody else is willing to do this. And here's this woman who's gonna have to make this decision right as she's like basically preparing to undergo surgery as she's like preparing to kind of literally go yeah. under. Yeah. And, but as she tells it, she pulled, she's the mother of teenage daughters. She brought those teenage daughters together. She explained to them, she told them for the very first time what had happened to her uh, at the hands of Harvey Weinstein when she was not much older than them. Um, they told her that they were so proud of her for uh, contemplating going on the record. They started to open up about the experiences that some of their friends had had. And she came away from that conversation completely committed. She wrote us an email that week and said, 
you know, I don't want my daughters to grow up in a world where this type of bullying behavior is, accept is acceptable. I'm prepared to go on record. Yeah. So either on the record or off the record, you encouraged a lot of women to speak out and tell you their stories, really. Um, you used a very specific argument for that. What was that argument? Mm -hmm. So one of the, what, you know, so I was actually, I will admit that I was on, um, I was, so I had done reporting on Trump in 2016 and then continued to report on him um, after he was elected. And then I had a baby. I went on maternity leave in the spring of 2017. So Jody actually started the Harvey Weinstein investigation while I was home on maternity leave. And so the very, we didn't even know each other very well. Um, we had had a couple conversations in the office, but I get a call from her while I'm at home sort of desperately trying to sleep train and um, get it going a little crazy with those first couple months of parenting. And so she calls me and she tells me like, listen, you know, after the Bill O'Reilly story, we're starting all these investigations into other powerful <coughs> figures. I'm reporting on Harvey Weinstein. I'm starting to get through to some of the first, you know, I'm making my first contact with some of the women that we think may have been victimized by him, but I'm not sure what to say when you've got those first 30 seconds on the phone, if you are able to get through to somebody, it's really hard to know what to say because one, you're asking them to open up about what may very well be the most painful experience in their lives. There are so many reasons not to talk to a reporter, especially when it comes to an issue like this. And so our editor had suggested that she give me a call because she knew that I had had a lot of experience working with and doing stories about victims of sex crimes. And so I told her that a argument that I had made, one that had worked for me in the past, was like, you know, we can't change what's happened to you in the past, but if you work with us and we're able to publish the truth, we might be able to help protect other people and we might be able to put your private pain towards some constructive use. Yeah. And that line became, and that argument became even more, and shortly after I got back from the maternity leave, I joined her on the investigation, and that argument became even more critical as we were getting closer to the finish line at first, when Joni and I had first started our reporting, we thought that we might be basically just doing, that we might have just been kind of unearthing the truth of what had happened in the 1990s at the height of Miramax. We might have just been doing kind of setting the historical record straight about what had happened behind the scenes of some of these Oscar winning movies. But what we realized about three or four months into the investigation was that there were, that he had allegedly hurt people as recently as 2015. There was a moment where people, this is another one of the so, sort of surprising figures that we encountered along the way. You know, Harvey Weinstein's corporate accountant of 30 years turned into a very, very important secret source for us. He ultimately slipped us records uh, that documented all these serious allegations of sexual harassment and abuse against Weinstein as recently as 2015. And when we got those records and when we realized that this person was basically still out there harming women. The stakes of our, the stakes of the reporting just skyrocketed. We realized that if we weren't able to report the story, if we weren't able to get it into print, that this powerful producer would likely go on to harm yeah. more people. So why do you think this argument was so successful with victims? I think that this, I think that this argument, I think that if people think, I think that it, if, I think especially, maybe this is, maybe especially in the case of women. Um, that they will oftentimes go out on a limb and sort of reach down and find the courage to do something that they think is going to help protect other people, even if they won't make that decision just for themselves. If they think that they're being part of, you know, if they think that they're gonna help the next sort of young woman who's working at the Weinstein Company to prevent her from going through what she, you know, what, what she went through when she was 22, I think that we found time and again that that seems to kind of unlock motivation that people didn't necessarily think they had. So your investigative work culminated in an article that we have here. Uh huh. And that really was not just an article, but it set off an entire movement. And uh, the whole Me Too movement that came out of it and really a watershed moment where uh, lots and lots of women felt okay to share their stories of sexual abuse. And what we really wanted to know is what was it about the specifics of your article that allowed for that moment? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Uh, and I think, well, first of all, it's important to note that, you know, Tarana Burke started the Me Too movement in, she started the Me Too hashtag in 2006. 
but there's no question that this story did help to ignite that movement and push it forward. As I mentioned, Jody and I could feel it within days of publishing that story as the dam broke and women were just flooding into the New York Times and into news organizations across the United States and ultimately around the world with their own stories of abuse and harassment. And I think that, listen, I think that this, I, I think we can't ignore the celebrity factor of the Weinstein story. But you had that with Bill O'Reilly and Bill Cosby. We, the, those were stories, this was the first story where some of the accusers were more famous than the accused. Mm -hmm. And I think that, listen, they're, to go back to all the reasons that women have for not coming forward with these stories, one of them had been like a very, very sort of, um, um, you know, misplaced sense of shame and embarrassment. Uh, like so often in reporting these stories, the women that we've interviewed have felt that they bore some responsibility for what had happened to them, that, this, that, they, that they were embarrassed and ashamed about what had been done to them. And that was one of the reasons that they were reluctant to speak out. And I think that when people like Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie stepped forward and said, it's happened to us, and we are among the most sort of powerful, famous women in the world, it showed that nobody was immune. And it also helped to kind of strip away some of that shame and embarrassment that had kept, helped keep women silent for so long. I think that was one factor. I think that this story also revealed itself to not just be about one single alleged predator, but it ultimately became an x-ray into abuse of power, you know, into the machinery that was in place to basically silence women who came forward, the secret settlements, the, and you know, we spent a lot of time reporting into, the, there were individuals and institutions that became complicit in Harvey Weinstein's abuse. The, Basically, there were news organizations that looked the other way. There were the talent agencies that continued to send women into hotel room meet meetings with Harvey Weinstein, even when their clients reported back very troubling experiences. And there were Weinstein's own companies, uh, the boards of his own companies who got glimpses of this problem and ultimately failed to intervene. And so I think that another reason that the story basically resonated and had so many ripple effects is because it was so much bigger and it helped shed light on so many additional factors that had been at play in allowing sexual harassment and assault to flourish. Yeah, and you mentioned in your book as well that it was an open secret in Hollywood. Then why did so many people fail to, to intervene? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was really, uh, you know, that was really one of the most pressing questions that we had. The moral horror of the Weinstein story was that he was able to engage in this behavior for decades, and so many people, not only did people not stop him, but there were people that helped him along the way. So one of the most, you know, if, if the corporate accountant who slipped us the internal company records was, was one of the more surprising figures that we met who helped bring, bring the truth to light, there were also these surprising figures who helped cover it up. I mean, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the name Lisa Bloom, but she's probably the most famous feminist attorney in the United States. If there's like a big sexual harassment or sexual assault case, she's on TV, she's representing those clients, she's got her fist in the air, she's talking about the importance of like fighting on behalf of victims and helping to give them voice. And in 2016, she crossed sides and went to go work for Harvey Weinstein. And she said later that she had done that because she thought he had only made inappropriate comments towards women and that she wanted to help him apologize for his behavior. And in the course of reporting this book, we obtained confidential records, her billing records, a, basically a job audition memo that she wrote to Harvey in which she spelled out her knowledge of all the more serious allegations against him and the darker role that she played on his behalf. Her, this job audition memo that we produced word for word in our book is basically her saying, I'm gonna take all of my experience working on behalf of victims, harness that, and use it on your behalf to work against them. She was saying, I'm gonna smear, I'm gonna manipulate, I'm gonna conceal. And you know, it's just it was just to us one of the most shocking things that we could have uncovered. So in your book, one of the victims, Zelda Perkins, she talks about this. She says, I want Harvey to be exposed but what broke my heart is what happened when I went to my lawyers. So 
who disappointed you more? Was it then Harvey or the Lisa Blooms mm -hmm. who enabled him? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there were the powerful lawyers, there were the private investigators. When we first, when, we, when Jody and I were starting this investigation, the editor of the New York Times, he had had some encounters with Weinstein over the years on other stories, and he had a glimpse into how he operated. So he pulled us into his office and he said, all right, like, this guy is dirty, you know, be prepared to like, assume that you're being followed by private investigators, talk like every conversation is being recorded. And so we were, didn't find that to be that shocking. It's not surprising for powerful figures to hire private investigators but when they're trying worse. to evade scrutiny. But this, oh my goodness, this was, this was a private investigative firm of a whole other order. This was a private investigative firm called Black Cube that is made up of former Israeli intelligence officials um, with agents who adopted fake identities uh, to target us, reporters, and our sources. One of the agents actually pretended to be a women's rights advocate. And um, all the while, as she was seeking to extract information that could be passed back to Harvey that he could use to try to stop our investigation. And if you could speak to these people, because you did in your book, okay. what do they say about the role they play? Right, so they have not, Black Cube, the Black Cube people refused, they, they, they refused, they did not, they no, did not. No, people like Lisa Bloom or right, some of the other so, lawyers. Right, so, so David Boyes, who's another one of the most famous lawyers in the United States, he's um, probably the most famous litigator, and had really been a hero on the left. Um, he had helped win the case of gay marriage before the Supreme Court, and as it turned out, he had also been Harvey Weinstein's biggest defender behind the scenes. He had helped him conceal and spin and manipulate allegations as they came forward over the years. And when Harvey Weinstein was looking for a way to stop our investigation, he was the one who executed the contract with Black Cube. This was basically a hit on our, our investigation. They were promised, these agents were promised a $300,000 bonus if they could stop us. Yeah. All super interesting, but I think now is the time to turn to our audience, because I'm sure there are more than enough questions here. Um, here at the front in the gray sweater. Yes, right. um, Wait one second, there's a microphone. <laughs> okay. um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about these NDA agreements and like how is it that women who are uh, you know, legally obliged not to talk end up actually telling like, their stories to you? Like, what is this process? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of the women did not tell their stories to us. It's important to point out only now are we seeing women we're starting to break these secret settlements. I mean, these secret settlements and the NDAs that go along with them are no joke. And to this day, even after more than 80 women have come forward with allegations against Harvey Weinstein, even as he's preparing to go on criminal trial in New York, there are the woman who, who, you remember I said, talked about the woman who I showed up in her, knocked on her door and she said, I've been waiting for this knock on my door for 20 years. She still has not gone on the record. She has not broken her secret settlement. She's terrified of it. And so, um, you know, we are just, this is, uh, but we're also starting to have a really important public debate about them. I mean, nobody would say that these women, that these victims don't deserve financial recompense for what's happened to them. And nobody would argue with the fact that many likely want and deserve privacy. But it's the secrecy that have got, that's gone along with those that I think has really started to emerge as a public danger. You know, these were these have been used as tools. These have been alleged predators from Harvey Weinstein to Bill O'Reilly to Larry Nasser, the gymnastics, you know, the, you know the, the the person who had preyed on all those gymnasts, have used these secret settlements time and again to cover their tracks and go on and hurt more people. Yeah. But if these settlements are really muting the claims of sexual, like sexual harassment victims. Um, why do so many women still choose to sign it? Is it purely financial? Well, listen, there's, there's the, the lawyers and some, the women themselves will say, listen, I wanted to do something about this, and I was told that this was my best, if not only, option. Going to court, you know, going public, going into court, it can be a really difficult path, um, and there's no guarantees that you're going to win and you may get pretty roughed up by you know, the alleged perpetrator in the process, who's likely gonna try to smear you and do other things to undermine you as you bring forward a public allegation. So I understand, I think it's very understandable why people have chosen to go 
the secret settle the, the settlement route. But there's now places like the you know California, the state of California, has passed a law seeking to restrict the confidentiality clauses, saying yes, there should be financial settlements, but these confidentiality clauses are a public danger. And so I think that the real question is like, is there a more fair way in which victims can receive financial recompense, but they don't serve as a tool for people to cover their tracks. Let's have another audience question. Over there in the blue, purple. So if you could stand up. Yes, you. Um, so we're, in the, like, we're doing a case study on the Kavanaugh case at the moment. Mm. So I want to know how um, victims can be portrayed, especially in that case where it's not sure who is right and who's wrong, or it's not finally proven. It's so hard to portray victims, and they get so um, so much attacked also like by Trump. Mm -hmm. So how should they be portrayed to yeah, save them as well and not just expose them to the public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're, it's interesting that you bring up Kavanaugh because you know our book doesn't stop with the moment that we published the Weinstein story and the dam broke and all these women started coming forward. That would have in some ways been too easy so we reported into the year that followed, and when we saw the Kavanaugh hearings playing out, when we saw Christine Blasey Ford's story emerging first in the pages of the Washington Post, and then in that electrifying testimony that she provided to the US Senate Judiciary Committee, we realized that that was probably one of the most compelling and complicated she said stories that we had ever seen. And so two months after she testified, I flew out to California and obtained the first interview of Christine Blasey Ford. She actually showed up to a restaurant in Palo Alto. She had her hat pulled down over her eyes. She was still living in hiding because of death threats. Um, and when she st started to open up and tell, explain the backstory uh, of her private path to testifying in Washington, we realized that it was so much more complicated than either side knew. There were, so, there were millions of people who watched her testimony that day, and some people saw her as the hero of the Me Too movement, and some people saw her as the villain, and we realized it was so much, it was just so much more complicated, and there had been so many more additional forces that had come to bear. And so we really, we, you know, we devote the last two chapters of our book to, to her story, and it's clear that this was that this was somebody, this was a citizen who felt like she had a civic duty to come forward and report this important information to the people who were going to be deciding whether or not to put Brett Kavanaugh on them into one of the most powerful positions um, in the country and what happened from the moment she decided to come forward up through after she testified when Trump and others, you know, set out to attack her and undermine her we thought was a really, really, that, that we, we would be not doing our jobs if we didn't help bring that to light. Yeah. And as you said, the Kavanaugh hearings, everyone was watching the exact same hearing, and some people thought she's a villain, some yeah. people thought she's a hero. How is that possible? How could it divide people so much? Well, I think that she, I think that she, that I think that that, that particular case really came to encompass so much of the confusing and complicated feelings that are swirling around Me Too now. I mean, like it was like we've sort of swept out the old rules of power and sex, but we have not come to a consensus on what the new rules are. And I think that there's really three pressing questions that we have not collectively answered, which is one, what's the scope of behavior that's under scrutiny? Are we only talking about serious allegations of rape and sexual harassment, or are we talking about more nuanced encounters bad dates, bad and awkward dates, um, and how far back are we going? Christine Blasey Ford tried to hold somebody accountable for something that happened in high school in the 1980s, something that she had never reported to the authorities or anyone else up in, you know, before those couple years leading up to him being nominated. So you know, that's question number one. Question number two is what is the process that we have for vetting these allegations? We at the New York Times know how we do it. We spend a lot of time in our book walking readers through all of the different steps that we take to seek corroboration, to obtain documents, and ultimately going to Harvey Weinstein, the subject himself, 
to give him adequate time to respond to what we're going to say in the name of fairness, in the name of accuracy. But when it comes to HR departments, when it comes to the court of public opinion, I don't think that there's any consensus on how to determine what's actually happened. And the third question is the question of accountability. Like, it's so easy for people to insist on an accountability, but it's so much more difficult to assign accountability. And so in, oftentimes these questions can even get scrambled. So in the United States, there was a Senator Al Franken who resigned amid these allegations of sexual misconduct. And almost from the moment he resigned, there was debate over whether or not that was the right response before anybody who had, so had determined what he had actually done. Because they're looking at the Kavanaugh hearings, it's evident that different parts of the country right. really have different views on, yeah. they watch the same trial right. and thought different things. Right. So can we hold people to different standards based on different places? Well, listen, what we can do is, you know, <laughs> you know, Anita Hill had, had come to Washington to testify about yeah. Clarence Thomas in a Supreme Court uh, nomination hearing, um, you know, like decades earlier. And um, at that time, there was no protocol in place by which the Senate, you know, the Senate could determine or vet allegations of sexual misconduct against the Supreme Court nominee. So it's very interesting that, you know, fast forward to 2000. 17 and Christine Blasey Ford, excuse me, 2018, and Christine Blasey Ford showing up in Washington to testify about alleged sexual misconduct against the Supreme Court nominee. Even there were some of the, even some of the same senators are still in the Senate. We're still hearing this, and there was still no protocol in place for evaluating these allegations. And so I think it it's seems just that a, some situations it's harder to have a protocol. I think so. Joe Biden is one of those people that was again in the Senate hearing, and he himself was accused of like, I think it was an article that he was hugging people and that people felt uncomfortable about that. In those situations, there's also no, still no protocol in what to think about that. Mm -hmm. Well, and those allegations really played out, I mean, there are allegations that play out in the pages and like within journalism and in the court of public opinion. But in the case of Brett Kavanaugh, I mean, he was basically up for a job and these hearings were part of the job evaluation process. And there were, there, you know, there, the, the, the fact that there were not standards and guidelines that were in place by which to vet these, that they kind of made up the rules as they went, um, I think became a problem not just for Christine Blasey Ford, but also for Brett Kavanaugh. And I think became symbolic of how, listen, there can be mounting growing frustration um, on both sides when you don't have these sort of pressing questions, consensus on how to answer them. Yeah, um, and so far we've been talking about how the legal system has failed the victims of sexual harassment to some extent, looking at NDAs and, and the other settlements. Um, do you feel like the public outcry that the Me Too movement has created on social media brings justice to these cases? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a good question, and I think that this goes back to since you know since we did our Weinstein investigation, there have been a variety of other stories report, reported reported out in the pages of other news newspapers and um, magazines. There was you know the Aziz, Aziz Ansari story. I don't know if you guys followed that. Um, really became kind of um, a symbol of a different type of reporting that was being done. That was a story that was basically told in the first person by somebody who chose to remain anonymous. And you know, in our Weinstein investigation, we had evidence of a pattern of alleged predatory behavior. We had documents, and nobody was off the record. I mean, that was the story. Our, our editors were adamant that you weren't gonna, we weren't gonna go forward with the story with anonymous accusations. How do you feel about the stories, like the one about season, sorry, where it's about sort of this uncomfortable, intimate encounter mm -hmm. where they have different perspectives? Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with those kind of mm -hmm. situations? Well, I think that those, like, listen, there are, there are, there, you know, there are the investigative stories that have helped, that have sought, to, like, that have ultimately led, to, you know, within three days of our story being published, Harvey Weinstein was fired from his own company, and he is now uh, being sued in civil court and is under about to go un undergo criminal trial. Um, there have been other stories that have been done in which people have applied different standards of reporting to tell these stories. 
And not every story has to be a hard-hitting investigative story to be worthwhile. So I'm not arguing that you have to basically do the Harvey Weinstein model or no reporting on this subject. I mean, I think that the Aziz Ansari story um, and some of the other stories that have not necessarily been as hard-hitting may, you know, they, they've raised conversations. They've, like, there's a question about the kind of gray, gray area of consent in dating that is an important conversation and needs to be had. And so I think it's also just important to make sure that we understand the, the different sort of journalistic guidelines that are applied in these stories. Yeah. But especially the story on Aziz Ansari shows that, that these public outcries really circumvent due process. Do you think it's, it's dangerous? Is it more dangerous than beneficial? I mean, what we do, um, I think that what, what, we, what we have done in our reporting and also in writing this book was to show what it looks like to report and write a story that builds consensus and helps sort of shift public attitudes. And it's not, the book, the title of our book is sort of deceiving, right? For so long, a lot of the model for reporting these types of stories was the he said, she said model, in which it was kind of her account versus his account. You can't really, you know, there's really no way to ter determine what actually happened. And we just, we like, we just shattered that model. And we said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have these women basically go out on a limb in a he said, she said model of a story. First of all, if we wait for that to happen, it's, we're never gonna get, be able to publish because the women were so terrified to go on the record. And so we ultimately, when we did go to ask Ashley Judd and Laura Madden to go on the record, it was after we had spent months gathering all this other evidence of wrongdoing, the financial trail of payoffs, the secret settlements, the, the other records, um, the company records, HR documents from inside his company showing all of these allegations and, and, and evidence of wrongdoing. Yeah. So I think it's time to go back to our audience. Uh, I'm sure there's still some questions. Maybe someone at the back, the young man at the front of the back. Hello. Uh, my question is about uh, the relationship between these stories and also power. Uh, when you see, for example, uh, the case with Jeffrey Epstein and what we're seeing with a lot of, um, with someone who clearly has a lot of money and connections with people who have a ridiculous amount of power, how do you think a media which is very connected to, uh, very connected to money, like of course the New York Times is part of a business, it's, it needs to make money and it can lose profit, how can you expect uh, a media organization to truly hold rich and people, rich and powerful people accountable when they are themselves dependent on rich and powerful people okay. being a business itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you how we do it at the New York Times, which is to you know report without fear or favor. Period. So, uh, not only was Harvey Weinstein like a powerful figure in Hollywood, he was also a huge advertiser at the New York Times. And when we started our investigation. He tried to march into the office, uh, the offices of the publisher and the executive editor, and get you know sort of do a like let's do powerful man to powerful man like you know conversation here and stop this. Let's just stop this reporting that these that these two lady reporters have <laughs> started. And and you know the response I'll give them you know we give them huge credit. The publisher and the executive editor said. We're not going to take your calls, Harvey. And if you've got, if there's anything you want to say, say it to the reporters. But it doesn't matter that you're an advertiser. It doesn't matter that you're a powerful figure. Our job is to hold the powerful to account, and we're going to do that even when it comes to New York Times subscribers. So, I mean, advertisers. So another question here at the front. One second, the microphone's kind of. If you could stand up, that would be great. Um, I have a question coming from me doing research on the link between um, right-wing populist parties and anti-feminism. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are also certain groups who promote the myth of achieved gender equality and um, feminism going too far also concerning the issue debate. Um, how do you see the relationship between right-wing populism and um, 
yeah, like mm -hmm. this issue. I mean, what I can tell you is politically, you know, as somebody who started reporting um, on Donald Trump as a candidate and saw how the allegations against him played out politically and how he how he used them to his ultimately sort of sought to use them to his political advantage, um, saying that these women were coming forward as a sort of part of the fake news and part of the, uh, you know, he called them like agents of Hillary Clinton's campaign, even though none of the women had any ties to her, to her and her campaign. So it's interesting to have kind of done that reporting and then have gone into the Harvey Weinstein story in which there was so much accountability and so much consensus and so much like unified outrage um, around him and then a lot of some of the other powerful figures who fell, at least in the, the sort of private sector. And then to have picked up the reporting on Christine Blasey Ford making an allegation against Brett Kavanaugh in the political realm. And to watch how not just Trump, but other Republicans seized on that sort of growing confusion and outrage and used that to basically not just go on the attack against Christine Blasey Ford, but to go on the attack against the whole Me Too movement. Um, it really became, that really became like a, a sort of vehicle for male grievance and really helped sort of, Listen, Donald Trump has had personal reasons for wanting to, I mean, all of those allegations have continued to trail him and he's had both personal and political reasons to want to basically undermine the Me Too movement. And once, Brett, once his Supreme Court nominee was accused and was accused in that manner and with so many other factors swirling around it, I think he was very quick to sort of seek to use it to put his political advantage. So one last question. Here in the red at the front. Hi. Um, my question is sort of kind of the next step future. Um, I think it was obviously a revolutionary period, the Me Too movement and um, how this culture of speaking about it and the change of norms um, what would be your ideal um, next step forward? What would you like to see happening now that we have started to establish um, or change the norms mm -hmm. on how we <coughs> treat this issue? Um, well, I think, you know, I think that, you know, as I said, I'm not an activist, I'm not a lobbyist. I can't stand up on this, you know, I can't sit here on the stage and sort of prescribe, offer up a prescription for exactly what should change and how it should change. But, you know, as a journalist, we really feel like you can't solve a problem that you can't see. And so our job, you know, Jody and I have continued, we, you know, somebody asked about the Jeffrey Epstein story. We reported on that right when we got back from Book Leave, um, which has a story that has so many echoes of the Harvey Weinstein story in terms of the people who helped enable him. Um, uh, you know, we are continuing to report on this, and I think that that's the role that we can play as journalists. I think, I think that it's really important to recognize that more than two years in, there's not, have not been the type of systemic changes to catch up with the shifts in cultural attitudes. Sexual harassment law has not changed in any meaningful way. There are still large numbers of workers who are not protected. These secret settlements are being still being signed every single day. And I think that it's really going to take not only systemic change, but like culturally some sort of consensus on these new rules of sex and power. And other than uh, investigative journalists, who else needs to step up and really lead this lead these changes? Yeah, I mean this was like listen, the, the, the Harvey Weinstein story and I think to a large extent a lot of the the reporting that has gone in, like that has played out in, over the last two years, has shown, has, has been a case in which journalism stepped in where other institutions had failed. And I think that, listen, I'm proud of that. I think that I'm proud of all the journalists who have, who have participated in this really important coverage. But journalism can, is not the solution. And, um, you know, there's, the, like, when it comes to the criminal system, when it comes to the civil system, um, I think when it comes to the, you know, when it comes to the laws, uh, I think that there's really, you know, it's, it's time for some of these other institutions to step up and do a better job. 
since your story, has there been a lot of change, you think? Or not I, I think, well, like, listen, it, in some ways it feels like everything has changed and nothing has changed at the same time. So our last question mm -hmm. is, a major theme of the whole Me Too movement has been the concept of speaking truth to power. And so now as you sort of finish your work, you've written a book, what topic or theme is in need of a similar moment of reckoning? Mm. I mean, there's, listen, um, as an investigative reporter at the New York Times, you know, we, we don't sit around like sort of wringing our hands over whether or not there's like another big story out there that's in need of our attention. It's like, which one to pick? Um, but you, especially had no. you guys had an intuition about the had, issue of sex, sexual abuse. Right, we had it, right, we had it, we had an intuition there. Is there um, a similar one on a different topic? You know, listen, if, if I, it, it would remain secret at this point. Um, <laughs> Um, I wouldn't be in a position to comment on that, but I think that, listen, I think that one of the, another great things, there's been a lot of sort of, there were a lot of cynical things that have emerged in the course of our reporting. Um, and, but I think that this is ultimately a hopeful story. Um, there have been at a time when things can feel so polarized and when things can feel so stuck and at a time when journalism is under attack and there are all these claims of fake news, I think that the Harvey Weinstein story ultimately was, like showed that brave sources and facts and journalism does matter and can make a bigger change than any of us ever imagined. I'd like to thank you so much for coming. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Powerful, I think, on behalf of all of us, we were really excited to have you here on our stage. Well, thank you so much. It's really, it's been such a pleasure to be here. And when people ask me where we're headed and where Me Too's headed, especially when I'm in, when I'm looking out at audiences like this, I want to say, you tell me. You guys are the ones who are going to be figuring this out in the years to come. Um, you know, you have the power here, and um, I just, you know, I'd, I'd ask you to sort of think seriously about it and use it wi wisely. So, thank you again. Thank you so much.